Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our breakfast seminar with uh, Amina Woods, who's going to be giving a wonderful presentation. So I hope you guys enjoy it, learn something new, have a good time. Uh, obviously, free food and coffee is back. All right. Um, you see this cover? That is the work that my lab at the National Institute on Drug Abuse did with the help of Vladimir and his group. Because, you see, gangliosides. Let me help you with this. For we, the brain is very important to us. It's what we look at all the time, is the brain. And one of the molecules, the brain is about 64% lipids. The rest is water and some proteins. So somebody tells you, tell somebody you're a fat head, it's true. It's all lipids in there. And um, the, one of the really important um, group of lip lipids are the gangliosides. And uh, they're very difficult to see. The other thing uh, I started doing a few years back when I saw a paper by Caprioli is, I saw that he had taken a piece of tissue and he showed that by adding matrix, he could see a few lipids, a few proteins, a few common proteins, it's too hard for a jacket. Sorry. So, um, I took a tissue section, got lots of brain from the work we were doing from a brain, and his was from a brain, and added matrix. It was simple and fast to see the uh, proteins. But then at the other low end, there was a forest of peaks, a lot of them. And I looked at them, looked at the masses, and I knew what they were. They were lipids. So I said, ha, ah, that's what I want to do, because that's what's important to me. However, it's practically impossible to see those gangliosides. But We eventually found the matrix that worked well with gangliosides. It's DHA or dihydroxyacetophenone. And um, I'm sure that, oh, I don't have to tell you what MOGI is and how it ionizes. You put your um, solution on the target and you add a saturated matrix you shoot your laser and molecules ionize and dissolve and uh, all lipids dissolve quite well with this matrix So that's just the workflow. It's rather simple. What you have to, you uh, always when you get your brains before you store them, uh, you have to make sure that you got rid of all the blood in the tissue by perfusing the animal before you get the brain out. Otherwise, all you see is blood. You don't see what you want to see. And you use um, 
this apparatus to section and then we take the section and when we started we used uh, it's called um, an airbrush and uh, used an airbrush to spray the matrix and that's a miserable way to go about because um, the temperature and the person as well as the humidity make the difference between how good the spray is. Once anyway, once you spray, you put it in your instrument and whatever it is, you acquire spectra and you get an image. Go. All right, that's how the section looks. Next. Um, you, so you add the matrix, and uh, what you do is called rastering. You move your laser, you don't move it yourself, the instrument's programmed to move it, let's say, anywhere from 5 to 100 micron, and you go over the whole tissue then you go to the next line and so on until you do the whole section. Then the, your software will give you peaks. Next. All right, and that's the pretty part because you look at each peak and because you use a good instrument, hopefully you have accurate measurement and you ask it to give you the distribution of the molecule in represented by this peak. So each peak is a molecule. So we have three peaks, three molecules, and then when you put them together, you get a, dis a map of your compound of the distribution of your compounds in the region of the brain that you're interested in. Next. This is one of the first images we obtained. And oh, it's quite nice for a first image. But we did better later on. Next, please. All right. Today, as the title say, we're talking about gangliosides. And they're very important because um, if there are genetic mutations, there are metabolic diseases that result because of lack of certain enzymes, and those diseases cause a lot of retardation and problem. So they are important. Lip uh, ganglion, gangliosides are important glycolipids to measure because they have uh, pathological consequences when they go awry. Next, please. All right, I am not going to go through the map of uh, how each type of gangliosides is made. You can find it in any biochemistry book. What I want to show is the starting molecule is ceramids. Ceramids are extremely important because it, they don't just play a role here, they play a role in many other, the formation of many other molecules. So, and they increase or decrease or depending in many diseases also. Most importantly, in some type of cancers and in traumatic brain injury. Next, please. So, those are the gangliosides that is GM1, GM2, GM3, and as you see, those are the kind of diseases where you see them. Alzheimer, Guillaume Berry syndrome, cancer. There are also um, other 
important one, which are the GD group, GD1, GD2, GD3. And GM2 literally drove me crazy the first time I detected it, because there was absolutely no reason for it to be there, considering that it is supposed to disappear within the first year of life. Next, please. All right, and this work here of the, the person who did the lab work was Benoit Koch, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time. And that was the first time we got tremendously excellent, as far as I'm concerned, images. And we saw GD1 and GD2 and, and GM and GD3. And not only did we see them, but we saw when they were as little as surrounding one structure. So that tells you how good this matrix really is. However, like everything good, it has its fault. Next. Ah. So the other problem that you get with ganglions are it's when you, whether you're using high or, or low fluency, they fragment. And you want to see your GGs, but you end up with GM1. Why? Because they lose sialic acid. When they lose, lose sialic acid, that's what happens. So you have to uh, look at what you get very carefully and then uh, you, if you normalize you can uh, decrease the effect you can see better what you have um, next please all right and this is I'm very proud of this this paper uh, was the first one and I did with a group from Israel they furnished the brain. These um, rats had been exposed to blasts and they were a two group. One that was located at four meter from the blast. TNT, big blast, and other that was located at seven meter of the blast. And as early as two hours, uh, then they sacrificed the animals at 224 and 70, 72 hours. And as early as two hours, we saw the accumulation of GM2 in certain areas, in the hippocampus and in the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And uh, it increased in this area at 24. There was still a trace. However, if you know there is somebody who's going to blow themselves, you run in the opposite direction. Because at 7 meters, the effect is far less. And this is the normal brain. And what we saw here is that GM2 increased significantly at 2 and 24 and in the 4 meter. But um, ceramids decreased. Next, please. <coughs> ah. Then, when we wanted to do imaging, usually the, what we started is an LTQ, and we acquired the images every 50 or 100 microns.
I really became ambitious and wanted to do 10 lifetime steps in our acquisition. Every, at every step you acquire four to 10 shots, then we will uh, complete the uh, average with the calculation of moving the image. But what we noticed is it started like a nice image, then deteriorated to a disaster. The reason why it deteriorated is because it turned out that this molecule under high pressure sublimates. Now we tried all kinds of experiments. We tried all kinds of things we couldn't get to fix itself. So, and now we do a lot of imaging when we not go from 15 to 40 hours, depending on how much resolution we want. Next, please. The other advantage that uh, of high resolution is look, this is this peak is 866, and we thought it was the surfaces, but then when we use high resolution, there wasn't one peak, it was one, two, three, and more peaks. And if you want to see every peak and do good work, you want to you use high resolution instrument and image for a long time. And that's where the AP module is of a lot of Next, please. Again, I can show you. Look at this under this peak, this mass. We, we, here we think we have one mass. No, we have a piece of uh, phosphatidyl choline as well as a string of myelin. Here also, this is low resolution. So you really see nothing. With the high resolution, look at what you see. So that's why you want to use high resolution if you can have it. Next. And um, in addition, um, what the AP Monty does is the pressure is much lower, the ionization is much softer, so you get far less fragmentation. The paper is out, so everything you see is in the paper, so you can read the paper. It's in the July 18 uh, Jasmine. And you recognize it because the cover is a chronal brain section image. <coughs> and these, these are the women who I showed you brain. We also did kidney and heart. And hey, look at how nice. You really get great detail. That's what I wanted you to see, is that with good resolution, good matrix, the right type of instrument, you get good images that in, I, I'm not showing it because it doesn't pertain to this talk, but in our second TBI study that, uh, we did, we could follow uh, the, the, I made a peptide drug and I could follow um, the effect of the drug on the, on preventing TBI through the images. So imaging can be a very powerful tool. Next, please. All right. So
So you see how you can see some truly tiny areas and resolve what molecules are in those areas. That's why it's nice to have the right instrument. Next, please. All right, in addition, oh, we, right now we don't need the airbrush because it takes too much time, too much sometimes, <coughs> as long as two hours for one section. Uh, instead, we, were, we do uh, nanoparticle implantation, but in cases like this one, where we did need a certain matrix, we bought an automatic um, sprayer. And then those are quite nice because you get, uh, you know exactly how much um, matrix you're depositing. And you also can deposit one layer, two, three, four, as many as you want. So this is, gives you better sample, sample reproducibility, uh, uh, control flow rate, and you can um, see a wide range of biomolecules. Okay. Okay. At AP, you have you are at seven hundred. And 64 atmospheric pressure, which is what AP is, while IP is high pressure. That's all right. So, what are all these images? These two show you the images acquired um, and deposited. Now is really the person who runs the lab. He knows everything better than I do, and would have been giving the talk here today, and would have given a better talk, but he couldn't make it because of the kids. <laughs> so um, the best um, matrices are that we've used are DHA and trihydroxyacid ethanol is quite good too. And we've done a lot of imaging through the year. Another secret that you can find in our papers is if you added ammonium sulfate um, to our matrix concoction in some with some matrices, <coughs> we improve our resolution. But as I was saying again, the problem with granulocyte is the fragmentation. Thank you. Next, please. All right. I want to show you those are with the atmospheric pressure source, that tiny Vladimir 
which you brought to us. Ah, you lose, you see, this is GD1 and those squares are sialic acids. Those sialic acids, one or more can get lost and you go from GD1 to GM1. Look, so this is at atmospheric pressure. You're not, lo you're not losing a lot of sialic acid. Oh, a GD1A and GD1B are isomers. But in a high pressure source, look at this. This is reduced GD's peak. And you think then that what you have there is GM1. Uh -uh. These are the result of the fragmentation. That's why it's important to have the right instrument to do your work, to get the right result. This is the C uh, AP model. Look at this. You still get a little bit of GM1, but nothing like here. Look, you have some nice GD peak. Next peak. All right. In this figure, all it really shows is that you could try to use other matrices, but like di diamino. So, and you can try to change the fluency of your source, but you still will get fragmentation. The best bet is always to use low pressure sources. Uh, a low pressure, like the AP model source. Next, please. All right, just wanted to show you pretty pictures, good spectra. Um, the DHA, this the DHA and the AP source, you see the correct distribution of GM1 and GD1. With, the, um, with this matrix, you get the incorrect So the AP model source with DHA really is what you need if gangliosite is what you're interested in. Next. All right. See, not only do you see the GD1, but you see where it is in which areas of the brain, clearly. Next. And so, in conclusion, if you couple the AP model source with an orbit graph, you can get some really high resolution data and very good images that give you a good map of the distribution of the compound you're interested in. So the matrix, uh, we, in spite of its fault of subliming this was eliminated by using um, AP sources. And the a in the AP source, we have far less fragmentation, which again, the fragmentation makes you think that you have GM1 when in reality you have GDs. Um, okay, that's what we see. And you can also <coughs> distinguish between the 
two types of genes, the A and the B. So this is what I have to say. And uh, I hope that uh, I gave you the message.